September 26, 2022. Halfcast 353, episode 353. Let's go. Of course, I have a few things to share with you guys. An evening of reflection. Shall we? Husband found guilty. 40 years after murdering his wife with an axe. When has a story ever ended with this not being the spouse? It's always the spouse. Oh, if true crime was around 40 years ago, they would have been screaming at the police, telling them that it was the husband the whole time. On a cold afternoon in February 1982, James Krausenek called the police to say he just arrived home from work and found this 29-year-old wife dead in their bedroom with an axe in her head. If I'm a detective, I'm looking at a gun might fit the puzzle, a knife or a blunt object might fit the puzzle for a random home invasion and assault. That might fit. That makes sense. But an axe is a very specific object. Innocent until proven guilty, my ass. That guy looks like I just naturally wouldn't believe a word that comes out of his mouth. Their three-year-old daughter, Sarah, was still in her own room inside their New York home. Red flag number two for me would have been if this was a random robbery, a random home invasion, they probably would have ransacked as much of the house as they possibly could, meaning that they probably would have ran up on the little girl also. Maybe they would have left her alone, maybe they wouldn't have, but they definitely would have touched every area of the house that they possibly could within the time that they had. The gruesome discovery stumped Brighton authorities who struggled to identify a suspect behind Kathleen Kathy Krausneck's murder. For decades, the cold case, which was dubbed the Brighton Beach Axe Murder, remained unsolved, even after investigators enlisted the help of the FBI and a celebrity coroner. What, no psychic? But in 2019, authorities arrested Krausneck, alleging he murdered his wife, staged the scene to look like a robbery gone wrong, and then went to work, leaving their daughter behind in the Del Rio Drive house. On Monday, a Rochester jury convicted Krausneck, a one-time economist for Eastman Kodak, who failed to complete his doctorate degree of second-degree murder for the February 19, 1982 crime. We did it. We did it. Justice for Kathy. May my family be finally able to heal. Annette Schlosser, Kathy's sister, told reporters outside of the Hall of Justice courtroom, this has affected us for 40 years. We have been dealing with pain and anguish over this man, and we saw him walk away in handcuffs, and that's what we wanted. And I cannot thank these two people enough right here and the investigative team for doing this for us. This is unbelievable. 40 years is a long time to start a new life, and what would have appeared to everyone else to be a very short mourning period for his wife he was probably already out there looking for spouse number two. During the trial, prosecutors argued that Krausneck murdered his wife with a single blow to the back of the head inside their home, driving home that no other DNA was present at the scene to suggest another assailant had entered the home. At the time of the murder, Krausneck told police he left for his job at Eastman Kodak at around 6.30 a.m. the day his wife was killed. The timeline initially shifted the blame off of Krausneck because a medical examiner first concluded that Kathy had died between 6.55 a.m. and 8.55 a.m. that day. That's a very broad window. That is no reason they should have ruled them out because of that. Later, when investigators revisited this case in 2015 with the help of the FBI, celebrity medical examiner Michael Baden determined that Kathy's body temperature actually indicated that she could have been killed when Krausneck was home. Exactly. That's a very general window that you were dealing with there. Prosecutors told jurors that the FBI was able to use new forms of DNA testing on the physical evidence at the scene and found plenty of Krausneck's DNA, but nothing from any strangers. Assistant District Attorney Patrick Gallagher said after the guilty verdict that the jury on Monday came to that conclusion because there was no other conclusion in the case. Prosecutors also noted that after the murder, investigators learned that Krausneck never completed his doctorate in college, but still went on to teach at Lynchburg College and land a job at Eastman Kodak. 
Both roles, they said, hinged on Krausneck having a doctorate. Authorities believe that Krausneck's false degree may have been a source of tension between him and his wife, noting that they found a marriage counseling pamphlet inside the family's car. How much you want to bet she did what any loving wife should have did and told them to stop faking it and get a real damn doctor. <laughs> Bro, man. You know he would be around all his friends talking big shit and she would just be looking at him like, stop lying. The former economist defense team, however, insisted that the circumstantial evidence in the case did not necessarily point to Crow's neck horrible defense. They also argued that police didn't pay close enough attention to Edward Larrabee, a convicted murderer who confessed to killing Kathy in a 1986 letter he wrote just before he died in prison. That's very convenient. That 1986 letter contained false information about the crime, which led authorities to believe Larrabee was not the true killer. Everything just fell right into place for Crow's neck because on two instances, the police were forced to look away from him. It was written in the context that he was dying, about to face his enemy. Defense attorney Bill Easton argued during the trial, there are some things wrong in the statement, but some are consistent, like the notion he wipes down the axe with a bath towel. Krausneck will be sentenced in November and faces at least 15 years in prison. Only 15 years? He murdered his own wife in cold blood while his daughter was in the next room and went to work and got away with it for 40 years. Next up. Wichita man sentenced in swatting case that led to death. What the hell is swatting, you say? Swatting is the action or practice of making a prank call to emergency services in an attempt to bring about the dispatch of a large number of armed police officers to a particular address which sounds like the work of someone with far too much time on their hands. A Wichita man was sentenced Monday to 18 months in prison for his role in a hoax phone call that led police to shoot and kill an innocent man in 2017. How is he only getting 18 months for this? And how did the police not properly assess the threat when they arrived at the scene? Shane Gaskill was sentenced after pleading guilty in May to wire fraud, KSN reported he was originally placed on probation but faced renewed prosecution after violating the terms of his probation. Of course he's going to violate probation. You slapped him on the wrist for a role that he played in someone's death. Of course he's going to think it's sweet. Prosecutors said Gaskill got into an argument in December 2017 with Ohio gamer Casey Viner over a $1.50 bet. What? Using an old Wichita address Gaskill had given him, Viner persuaded Tyler Barris in Los Angeles to call Wichita police and say kidnapping happened and shooting that happened at the address, prosecutor said. You know why this wasn't a thing back in the day? Because we had girls. <laughs> there was a world outside of the keyboard. A dollar fifty cents. You gotta be kidding me. What I don't understand is who determined that it was a SWAT situation. SWAT comes in after everything, negotiations, and basic police training breaks down. That's when you bring in SWAT. Who told them that this was a SWAT situation? Andrew Finch, 28, who lived at the address, was shot and killed by police after he opened the front door to see what was going on outside. Due to the nature of the call, I get it, I understand. But that still did not call for that man to get shot just for opening his door unarmed. Barris was sentenced to 20 years in prison, rightfully so, after pleading guilty to 51 counts of making fake emergency calls and threats around the county, including the one that led to Finch's death. Viner served 15 months in prison after pleading guilty to conspiracy and obstruction of justice. I don't know how much accountability they gave police in this particular situation, but it's clear that they could have practiced a lot more restraint in properly assessing the situation. Next up. Oh, because we're not done with SWAT. Man shot by Chicago police infiltrated SWAT training. We're talking about a guy who walked into the middle of a training session where law enforcement officers 
are learning new ways to neutralize threats and they're just itching for a reason to put it to use. <laughs> Talk about bringing the honey to the hornets. A man climbed five stories of a fire escape to infiltrate a Chicago police facility Monday while officers were undergoing a SWAT training exercise and grabbed at least two guns before he was shot and wounded by police, the chief said. Let me get this straight. This man climbed five stories, entered your facility, and managed to get a hold of two of your weapons? Why aren't you giving him an interview? <laughs> because he clearly exposed gaps that your training didn't. Police Superintendent David Brown said the suspect was taken to the hospital with injuries not considered to be life-threatening. One officer was taken to the hospital with a sprained ankle. Brown said the suspect was seen on video leaving the facility and then returning to infiltrate it. He asked where to go to retrieve personal property at the facility in Holman Square on Chicago's west side. Then he came back to the building and climbed the fire escape to the fifth floor where a door had been propped open for ventilation because there are no windows on that floor. This is real sloppy work. They let that man walk onto the facility like they were holding tryouts for the Bulls. <laughs> Brown said it has not been determined if the man went to the building to retrieve property, saying that the man had an extensive record. Check him for any sort of military background. It wasn't immediately clear if property taken from the man was stored in the building. Probably not. He had no other information about the man other than to say he was a resident of Waukegan, a suburb about 42 miles north of Chicago, which he probably jogged all the way there <laughs> just as a warm up and climbed five stories. Police later said the man is 47. Brown said investigators believe the man grabbed at least two guns that were on a table during the training exercise and pointed them at officers. He said the guns did not have live ammunition in them adding that they were either empty or contained munitions such as pellets that are used for training exercises because they sting when they strike a person but do not cause serious injury or death. He said he did not know if the man attempted to shoot officers with the guns. If nothing else, definitely a wake-up call to stay on point. Gotta keep your head on a swivel. He said the investigation will reveal what officers in the room knew about the guns the suspect took. Brown speculated on what officers in the training room saw as the man entered the room. This almost sounds like this was part of the training. These were guns that were being watched, he said. Obviously, someone coming from a stairwell outside startled everyone. Who is this person? Is this person associated with the training? That would be my first thought, and I probably would have been the first one down thinking that. <laughs> we do have live actors sometimes who come in playing clothes. See? He also said that it was likely the officer said something to the man when they spotted him, but that we just don't know what that officer said. He said most of those taking part in the training were tactical officers assigned to specialized units, but that a few of them were uniform officers assigned to City Hall or to Mayor Lori Lightfoot's home. You know, the same type of people who cannot afford to be caught off guard and have to be ready to act at the drop of a dime. The officer was taken to Mount Sinai Hospital and listed in good condition with the ankle injury. He was not shot, Brown said. The suspect was initially described as being in critical condition with at least one gunshot wound. Later in the day, Brown said the man's injuries were not life-threatening. Department spokesman Tom Ahern said the man has been placed under arrest and is under police guard in the hospital because he is a suspect in the incident. He did not know what specific charges he might face. The shooting is being investigated by the City Civilian Office of Police Accountability. The officer or officers involved will be placed on routine administrative duties for 30 days, the police department said. The police facility is in a large red brick building that houses evidence and recovered property on the first floor. If you didn't know before, now you know, right? Some of the police department's specialized units also work out of the building. Early Monday afternoon, crime scene tape was stretched across South Homa Avenue, a block south of the police station and across the same street. Just north of the building, a nearby school was placed on lockdown. Fun show. Fun show. Fun show. That being said, I'm going to wrap this one up, but I'll be sure to talk to you guys very, very soon. Adios.